This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go-to for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high-intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. The team at Imagine Strength breathes hit. Their passion for high intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of HIT studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a HIT business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the HIT industry forward and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your HIT business the Imagine Strength edge. Be part of the HIT revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your HIT business with Imagine Strength. Today's episode is sponsored by Joint Friendly Fitness by Bill De Simone. Having observed Bill's dedication in creating this book and hearing its acclaim in the fitness community, I eagerly dived into my copy. The book has innovated our approach at Optima Strength and refined my personal workouts, emphasizing safety and effectiveness. For those grappling with training pains, injuries, or concerns about joint health, this book offers solutions. Bill's blend of personal experience and biomechanics expertise birthed the joint-friendly fitness approach. Esteemed experts like Dr. Ellington Darden call it the best book on the biomechanics of strength training, while Dr. Doug McGuff labels it a masterpiece, praising its clarity and valuable exercise visuals. Move past the sea of complex fitness books. Joint Friendly Fitness is both engaging and actionable, categorizing exercises by safety. Dive into its wealth of exercises backed by the five-star Joint Friendly Rating System. Elevate your fitness with Joint Friendly Fitness, available on Amazon Worldwide. Lauren Snell here and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your hip business and fueling your passion for high intensity training. This is episode 427 and I've kind of aptly named this episode Hit Training Protocols to Spice Up Your Routines and Make Loads of Money. Today's guest is Pete Serqua. Pete is a master high intensity fitness coach and creator of the 90 Second Fitness Solution. He has been professionally coaching since 1985 and is also a five-time best-selling author for Simon & Schuster and Skyhorse Publishing, which include the books High Intensity Fitness Revolution uh, for Women and High Intensity Fitness Revolution for Men. His new program, Million Dollar Trainer, shows personal trainers how to earn seven figures per year. Pete, welcome back to the podcast. Great to see you again. Great to see you, Lawrence. What was the last part of that? Make loads of money? That's the part that got my attention. I don't think I heard anything else. <laughs> That's all you care about, basically, isn't it, Pete? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you don't, I really want to have a chat with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I mean, it's probably worth saying, though, that obviously the uh, the hit protocols we're talking about today, which I've seen, obviously, I've had a glimpse of, and they're really interesting, are, are obviously very useful to the fitness enthusiasts listening to this, people that are just passionate about hit as well. But um, we're going to be obviously talking about how they can be incorporated into the business to to grow the business effectively and to keep clients excited and get great results and all the rest of it. Um, as As you know, I did a little bit of prep for this. I made some notes on the protocols that I've seen you you talk about online and some questions around that. But then I saw your preparation. I thought, no, you know what? Pete's is a hundred times better than mine. So we're just going to use yours instead. And so let's let's take a look at yours and let's just take it away. You've got you've got the notes. So go ahead and, and I'll just ask questions as we go. Okay. Well, uh, we're we're talking about protocols today and we're talking about where they apply. So let's just start with the, the criteria, the criteria of what makes a good training protocol. And obviously this conversation is centered around high intensity training only. We're not going to get into a lot of other stuff and that, that'll be made even more clear soon. 
So my, my short list of criteria, safe, effective, and a protocol that makes the user or the person uh, or the client work harder than they normally would. And when you really just take a step back from this whole thing, that's what high intensity training is. You're making somebody, somebody get out of their comfort zone during a set and just work a little harder than they normally would, right? So they're, they're in the gym and they're doing 20 pounds, 10 times, three sets. That's not working hard. We need something that makes them stimulate the muscle. That doesn't necessarily mean blood and guts, right? So that's where we're starting at. That's our criteria. And, that, and that's where we're going to go. We're, uh, we're, we're going to open with. The next uh, thing that we want to kind of d discuss and go over is when you're choosing a HIT protocol, what is your goal? And this is really important, right? Is it for you? Is it for your client? Is it for your studio? Um, and, and those things vary. Yeah, your client and your studio, that there could be a big difference there, right? In, 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 the, in terms of need and productivity. Um, but let's look at some of these questions that I put up of what your goal may or may not be. Is your goal to add one inch to your arms or be a bigger bodybuilder? That's definitely one style of hit. And we'll talk about that in more detail in, in a little bit if you'd like. Uh, is your uh, your goal to increase strength and lean muscle, you know, and, and that's my, my, one of my taglines, smaller, tighter, stronger, healthier. If that's your, is that your goal? I, I know this is good for me. Uh, and I don't want to do it often, but I want to do it. And I want to get a result. Okay. Well, that's definitely a little different goal than, you know, I'm competing in a bodybuilding show, a natural bodybuilding show, and I need size and I need leanness. I mean, like to, to the extreme, right? So those are a little different goals. And then of course, the third, the third goal in choosing a hit protocol is my favorite. Do you want to make a lot of money? Very end of story. I that mean, was the, that was the clincher, Pete. When I saw that line in your prep, I thought, yeah, my notes suck. This is way more funny. And you just got such a way with words. Uh, I definitely think, and maybe you already noticed, we, we might have a difference of opinion on those first two. Um, but that doesn't matter. That's fine. I'm, I'm open to, to hearing the, the, the elaboration if you want on those. Yeah. No, let's, let's, let's discuss the difference of opinion because I want to know. And, and, and I, you know, it's how many years, I mean, I'm 60 years old now. I've been doing this since I was like two feet tall and I, you know, I still am fascinated by it. I still read the research. I still go over my notes again and again. So I am totally open to debate and different opinions. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not my way or the highway for sure. So let's take the first two and let's, let's hear what you have to say about it as well. Uh, well, if, your, go ahead. if your goal is to add an inch to your arms, um, let's just go with that before we go with the whole bodybuilding thing. If you wanted to add an inch to your arms, what would be your favorite hit protocol? Well, I'm of the really boring opinion that if you're basically training to muscle failure within a, let's say a 60 to 120 second time under load, it's the same outcome, right? So I just think that genetics mediate everything. And I know there's a lot of my listeners who don't agree with this probably, um, but that's my take. So my, my, my very short handed opinion is that one and two are kind of the same. So to add an inch to your arms or get bigger overall or to increase strength and lean muscle. Um, let me think about this for a second. Yeah, I would say, well, actually, uh, I'm probably conflating different things here. I'm more talking about when we did our first podcast together and you talked about how higher volume gave you a lot more size and lower volume, higher intensity made you shrink. And that's what I had a difference of opinion about because I feel like both, if both were taken to muscle failure, I think it's kind of the same. But I also think that sh workouts taken short of failure of much greater volume, but the vast majority of people don't produce any different results. And I wonder if you are an outlier. And I guess that's my very shorthanded uh, perspective on this. So I actually did a little research on this and I look okay. into a uh, researcher. There, there's a great podcast called House of Hypertrophy mm -hmm. um, who goes over a lot of studies and meta-analysis. And in addition to him, he cites people like Brad Schoenfeld, James Fisher, all of our favorites, right? Uh, notable people. 
and they talk about um, size and strength and how the mile five rules when you're when you're increasing strength the mile five rules uh and and please don't quote me on this research because I, I i really didn't memorize it for this particular conversation of course but one of them is a sweat basing a, a swelling of the mile five rules and the other one is a more strands again don't quote me on this but there was a difference so when volume and frequency was increased you got this swelling of the of the fibers and with the, it was strength and less frequently and higher intensity, it was more of them, which was like a band of steel. So there was a difference in the research. Um, now we can take a, your favorite hit protocol and possibly do it more frequently, three times a week for per body part to increase size. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. And, it, and, and when I say a possibility, I'm saying, look at the current research. Yeah. And they're looking at volume and frequency to do this. Um, the muscles don't necessarily take a week to recover. Okay. Uh, if you want increased strength and lean muscle or basically smaller, tighter, stronger, healthier, right? My, my tag, um, it's the slower reps. It's less frequent. You're getting a result, but you're not necessarily making this massive change in your body. Okay. So, that's what okay. some, that's what the research is leaning towards now. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm certainly open to to the reading that research and and is it a podcast House of Hypertrophy? Is that what it is? I think I've it heard is. of it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. And obviously, P, like you know, keep enough minds to so send it over to me. I don't want to sidetrack us though on this podcast because I think the real value on this one is is I don't think this stuff really matters. This this difference of opinion that we have on this, I I, I don't. I, I think um, what's really valuable here is is you going through. Uh, your your prep your notes here in terms of um, how you design a hit protocol to make a ton of money, um, right? And um, and I'm really excited to get into that. So, what's the next step? Are we getting into your favorite researcher, Wayne Westcott, and his findings? Wait, wait and, and this is no disrespect to the, to the notable people that and some of uh, who I just mentioned, but Wayne Westcott is my favorite research, and simply because he is focused on hit training protocols. I mean, that's what he researches. He, he is 100%. He, yeah. You've never saw, uh, seen a Wayne Westcott study on 20 sets per body part. Yeah, right. So let me, let, let me review some of his findings. And this is where, when I take his work, uh, this is how I develop what I'm going to do. And this is where I'm getting the information from. So Dr. Westcott, uh, he, he really is... Um, a big proponent of the standard Nautilus 2.4 protocol. And we're going to call it the standard Nautilus uh, protocol uh, for the rest of this discussion. But uh, for those of you who don't know, and I know everybody watching this knows it like back of their hand, the Nautilus 2.4 protocol is a two second positive followed by a four second negative. Uh, Arthur Jones put this together 150 years ago. Uh, it, had <laughs> been, uh, it, it was proven then. It, with limited research, he proved that it was an effective uh, training protocol. It was eight to 12 reps to positive failure, um, and it produced an excellent result. Uh, Dr. Westcott has been studying this protocol and how to extend the set and add to it for many years. And he's got great numbers, excellent figures. So the eight to 12 reps to failure with a two second positive, four second negative uh, has an average set time of 48 to 72 seconds. Okay, just an interesting note because you know, my thing was 90 seconds fitness, which is a maximum of 90 seconds, not a minimum. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. once you go past 90 seconds, I don't think the effect is any better or worse, right? So might as well cap it off. Uh, so 48 to 72 seconds average time. Since literally the 1970s, this protocol is held up and, and, and is one that I consider the gold standard. All of our work and all of our businesses are based on this, this basic protocol, one cent to failure, uh, a certain speed, not too slow, not too fast, um, positive failure, and then, and, and then some. So now let's look into Dr. Westcott's uh, research on extending the set. How does one extend the set? Uh, first thing that he, uh, uh, first thing that I read that, that I really enjoyed was he calls it breakdown training. Others of us will call it drop sets. Okay. And basically it's, you get to positive failure in your eight to 12 reps. 
and then you'll reduce the weight by 20% quickly, move the pin very quickly, get right back into the set and go to failure again. That's the protocol. Now, mm -hmm. that protocol has been proven by Dr. Westcott to show a 40% greater gain in strength than the standard protocol alone. Uh, and this is a book. I don't, but I'll find it in a second. I'll hold that up for you. I'm wondering if that's been, if that has been updated with, I know a study that actually, I believe it was Discover Strength collaborated with the Jameses. So James Steele and James Fisher um, mm -hmm. to show, and I guess this would support my take on that, you know, I think all roads lead to Rome for the most part, that um, advanced techniques, breakdown sets included, made no difference. Um, but again, you know, open to that being challenged. And I, I wasn't aware of uh, when we got uh, research on that specifically. So yes, I don't know what, yeah. When you look at his, uh, his chart, um, uh, the, the standard protocol gained an average of 18 pounds of strength on their exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the breakdown people gained 25 pounds. So, uh, you know, the 40% is a dramatic number. You know, 40% increase. You're, 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 you're doing the math in your head and you're thinking, well, my right. bench press just went up to 400 pounds, right? But it's 18 to 25 pounds is your, is your 40%. Yeah, and, and, and just, just for the record, like, even though I might dispute the idea that you see a big increase in strength in terms of like how the, you know, the study design of these different studies um, that might show that, I love advanced techniques. I think they're a great way to get more out of a client, get more out of myself, and you make the training kind of fun. So let's just make that clear. Like I am a huge supporter of them. Um, yeah, I as well. I mean, and that and that's where it all comes down to. It. Like when a client walks in the door and say, "Hey, guess what? We're doing breakdown training today." Well, I never heard of that. What's breakdown training? And you describe the set, and there's this enthusiasm. You just sold the workout, and you just sold the next fifty workouts. I mean, and if you don't use these things that have been given to you, it's a gift. If you don't use them, then you're just shortchanging yourself. You're not making as much money as you can be making. It's really that simple. I mean, even if the research, even if you found reputable, and there is always, Lawrence, always, for every study that tells you an egg is healthy, there's a study that tells you it's gonna kill you. I don't like that argument. Do you, know what I don't, do you know what I don't like that? I was thinking about that today, I had a conversation with someone this morning about that. Okay. I, I don't like it because my retort to that is always, well, yeah, but there's loads of low quality studies and the research in health and fitness is shocking the quality of it overall. I mean, engineers, you know, from the more kind of, um, rigorous scientific fields laugh at it. They think it's just terrible in terms of the way studies are done for the most part, but then it comes down to study design, doesn't it? Like, I, yes. I, I this is not a slight against you at all. When I say this, because I know you do read the research, but when someone says to me, oh, you can always. I'll say a study and they'll say, oh, but you can always find a study to support whatever you want it to. And I'm like, yeah, but that's why you look at study design to then discern right. between them, right? To know what study is high quality and higher, um, uh, it, it, it derives a more accurate explanation of reality versus another. So anyway, sorry, I'll, I keep derailing you, but I couldn't well, help but, but you just could even, you could still find Between James and James, you could still find a difference, right? Oh, one probably. Found one result and the other one found another result. Yeah, I'm sure they've, they've definitely got differences of opinion. Well, they, at least they did have on, on little aspects of training, perhaps. Well, maybe not, actually. I'll, I don't want to speak for them. I, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't recall accurately if that's true, but right. Yeah. And yeah. I'm speaking in broad terms here. I'm not, you know. Um, sure. But, but to get back to this, so, so the breakdown training showed, let's just say it showed a, an increase, okay? And, or a be, let's say, let's call it a benefit versus being detrimental, right? So breakdown training uh, and, and Dr. Westcott's research showed a 40% uh, strength increase versus the standard protocol. Assisted training, assisted training, and, and, and we call assisted training forced reps, right? We're assisting the client through additional reps once they've reached positive failure. Uh, specifically, Dr. Westcott would use five forced reps at the end of his set. So he had a very specific number, which I appreciate greatly. Maybe you want to give your client one four strep, maybe it's three. He used five for his research and he found was the number of 45% strength increase over the standard protocol or in addition to the standard protocol, mm -hmm. right? And again, it, when you look at his, his book and his research in the graph, it's like 
I, I, I told you with the breakdown training was 18 versus 25 pounds. This is going to be 19 versus 28 pounds or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Not, not off the charts. Oh my God, I got to do breakdown training exclusively. This is the way to build muscle. It's a great tool and that's what it should be. And I always tell trainers, you need a toolbox. Okay. You got to have a toolbox. And in that toolbox, you have to have the tools that make you ridiculously successful and rich and don't have any tools in there that are a waste of your time and don't make you money. Mm -hmm. uh, break down the equipment that you choose is a tool. The studio design that you choose is a tool that protocols are tools. These are your tools. These are your sales, sales, uh, uh, features, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the next one that he looked into was the effectiveness of slower speed reps. And he found that slower spe spe uh, speed training produced a 50% greater gain than the standard speed reps. Mm -hmm. So anything slower than two, four produced a result. That's really all you have to go with that. You don't have to get into what speed and what, you know, uh, you know, obviously the pullover has a speed that's a little different from the calf raise, right? Sure. So don't go there. Just saying, slowing it down. Now, why is that important to us? Because slowing it down or a forced rep or a, a breakdown means that we have to do our job. And what, every time we do our job and we're verbal about it and physical with it, that's a service that this client needs. And when you look at this, if you take a big step back from all of this, you'll find that you can't do it without a trainer or a training partner. What if you want to do this on your own? Well, you and I can go to the gym. You go over and do your machines. I'll do my machines. And we could all do eight to 12 reps to failure. We know we're going to get a result, right? Yeah. I can three force reps on my set. Well, how am I going to get that done? Hey, Lawrence, can you come over and help me out? I need a personal trainer or a training partner. I mean, I need one. There's no way around it, right? Now, yes. some of these set extenders, you can do on your own and get a result. I mean, we could do it. We could add a little bit negative accentuated or negative only. We'll talk about that in a bit. We can do pre-exhaust, wonderful protocol, and we can get a result. But what if you want to get into some of these other ones? I and mean, I think these are the greatest tools for a trainer. And if you're not using them, you're just shortchanging your income. Your bank account isn't what it could be, right? I know I keep going back to that. No, I, I, it does make me laugh. I, I enjoy it though. Um, but I no, I think the point to keep coming back to is obviously, we've, you know, I think it's kind of obvious that what we're talking about here in almost every uh, aspect is safe, right? Slow speed of movement um, for the most part. And it's effective, right? It's, um, it's getting someone to, to, to muscle failure. Um, and it's the, you've got obviously research here to show an improvement in strength and, and, and so on. And, but the key one, I think, well, those are obviously important, but that, that I just think it's great. This line you've added here it makes the personal client work harder than they normally would. And a, a same way of saying that is just making it easier for someone to work of a high level of intensity. And that's what I feel like the art of this always is. It's like. We know that if someone pushes close to muscle failure, they're probably going to optimize most of the adaptations they want. And it's like, how can we be crafty and cute and clever and, um, and get them there almost not without them knowing it, but there's an aspect to that. It's like understanding someone's tolerance for intensity and crafting that repetition, that protocol exactly so that you're, you're kind of adapting the protocol to them so you get the most out of them, whether that's, uh, like you say, a drop set, a full strap breakdown sets, uh, heavy negatives, so negatives, whatever. It's like using all these things. And to your point, you can't do that by yourself very easily. So, uh, right. yeah. And isn't that the service? What's that? Isn't that your income and your service? Yeah, exactly. You need me for, you know, Hey, I can, I can get this job done for you in 15 minutes. You won't break a sweat and, but you're going to need me to do that. You can't go to your gym and do this on your own. Mm -hmm. And you can't find the equipment that I'm using to do like, that's important. Yeah. You're really making a market for yourself. And, and obviously there's, there's obviously, you know, this, but, um, there's so much more value in the supervision element, as well as the, the advanced techniques. There's obviously just the accountability of another human, 
uh, the encouragement, the form, the, the feedback on form and making sure someone's using really safe form when they're training. There's so much more to that and the relationship, I guess, as well, and probably other factors. Let's talk about that for a second. And I made a note here, uh, which I'm not going to go look for, but um, let's talk about exactly what you just mentioned, okay? And what we're going to do is let's imagine a set of 12 to 15 reps and a 1-1 one, one speed, okay? One second positive, one second failure in good form, okay? Nice form, good set, okay? What kind of service can you provide for that set? The client sits down, let's just take a chest press because it's just obvious, right? Uh, and and they're, they're doing one, one form and they're going to 12 reps, okay? What kind of coaching and service can you provide at that speed for that kind of set? Almost nothing. You're three counting point reps. Point. One, two, good, that looks good. Three, I mean, it's that, that. You really need to give them something they can't get anywhere else, right? But when you slow that speed down or you go to a uh, set extension, well, now it's, you know, I could actually sit back. I've done this. I could say, okay, you're going to go eight to 12 reps to failure. When you get there and you start to struggle, I am going to jump in. Listen to my cues. This is where the set really starts. Wow. That was instruction. That got their attention. So they start doing their thing and, they, and maybe they're not going that slow. Maybe they're doing a, like a one, one or a two, two speed, but control. And now they start to struggle. Okay. I'm going to force this rep out, hold it at the top, wait three seconds. That's called a static contraction. Now lower it as slowly as you can. Don't let it crash. Right. Yeah. On the bottom. Okay. One, two, three up together. Let's do another one of these. This is called a negative. And we're going to, that's instruction. That's what they're paying for. They've got your attention and you're giving them a service and it's all about them. And that's what all these, like when I look at protocols, you know, people say, well, what's the best protocol? The one that you can teach 20 times a day with enthusiasm and get a result and it's safe and effective of the whole thing, right? It's the package of it. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to, and you really got to think about this. We've talked about this earlier. Do you want to get to 10 or 20 sessions per day? If you do, you really have to have a few things organized, like the training protocol that lights you up every single set. Because in 20 sessions, and I've done over uh, 24, 25 in a day, how many sets is that? Well, times six exercises, it's a lot of sets, right? We're at 150 sets a day. I got to deliver that. The, the last set of my day should be just as good service-wise as the first set of the day with my coffee, right? So absolutely. That's yeah. why we're looking at a lot of this stuff. Love it. Yeah, I agree. I think that's great points. Um, where, where are we going to next? Let's look, uh, just quickly review other techniques that, that uh, I don't have numbers on. So I gave you breakdown numbers, force rep numbers, uh, slower speed training, uh, and how they compare to the standard uh, Nautilus 2.4 protocol. Other techniques that I'm very, very fond of, and of course, this is not maybe not a complete list, but it's, it's a good basic list. Free exhaust, negative only or negative accentuated, uh, and rest pause reps. I want to talk a little bit about the rest pause reps. Uh, rest pause reps were first promoted by Mike Menser in the 70s as a training pro. And I want to tell you how that was. And it, it's important because it's the one, it's the version that I believe in. I think it's really effective. Then there's a guy named Dante Trudell uh, who created uh, something called DC training. I'm not going to tell you what DC stands for. You probably already know. It's just, it's, it's a stupid name. Um, but he created this protocol based on rest pause sets. Uh, now Dante says- It's dull, dull crap, isn't it? That's dog crap. It's just, uh, I just can't stand <laughs> it. Like out of all things you could have thought of, that's, that was the <laughs> best you got. So. Um, memorable member. Yeah. Right. right? I, but I'll go with DC for this, for this conversation. So he does a set where you pick a number of reps, like 25 and you want to get there in three attempts. So uh, you get, uh, 12 reps to failure, and then you take 15 breaths, not 15 seconds, but 15 deep breaths. And you go eight reps to failure, 
and you take 15 more and you get your last five reps, something like that. Okay, this is vastly different from Mike Menser. Mike Menser's reps pause technique was warm up and do your one rep max. Now think about a real one rep max on a machine and on a machine is a port, not a barbell because we have to remove the balance factor, okay? And the technique factor. Well, let's say you're doing a chest press and you're at a one rep max and you are pushing, once you lift that weight off, you are pushing as fast as humanly possible and that weight is not moving very fast. And it probably is an eight, nine, 10, 12 second rep and you get it up there. Now you have to lower it under control so it doesn't crash down. I mean, that's just out of necessity. It's not a technique anymore, right? You just don't want to die kind of a thing. You put the weight down, you take 15 breaths or 30 seconds, whatever Mike uh, recommended back then, but it was a very short period of time. You do it second one rep max. You were trying to get your rep ranges was like uh, three to six. You wanted to get at least three of these. And if you can get six, you needed more weight. So, and, and when you think about it, if you, if, if nobody's done this, but if you were standing next to Mike Menser while he was coaching one of these sets and you were to time each repetition for the three to six rep, you'd probably come up with our 48 to 72 seconds. I mean, it's really incredible. Like the numbers really held up, but that's a true rest pause set. So if you accumulate the time across all sets, it comes to about that. Is that what you're saying? I, I think it does. I think, I think yeah. all roads lead back to this is an effective time under load. Mm -hmm. And we get there so many different ways, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's not a true one rep max, and you can really just push it right up in two seconds, it's not effective. It's got to be a way you're struggling under. Now, is this a safe protocol for a 65-year-old female with osteoporosis? Yeah, I probably, probably don't want to do this one, but <laughs> you know, but I do, I, I have used with 70 and 80 year olds, I have used negative only training where I've given them a weight that I know that they can't lift just outside of what they can't lift. So if it's a hundred pounds, they can, I've, I've strength tested them and they could lift a hundred pounds. I'm going to give you 110. You can't lift this, but it's not really that far out of the realm. It's not 140 like it should be. 40% more. And I let's lift together, hold it statically for a quick count of five, four, three, two. Now put the weight down gently. I don't say lower slowly, just put it down so it doesn't crash on the bottom. Let's do five of those or three of those. And it turns out, and I'm always timing sense. It turns out that we got the minimum time that we wanted and it's effective and it, it, it is safe. So yeah. An interesting protocol, but I, that, that was my take on rest, pause reps. If you ever want to use them, if you have a client that is in good shape and good health, the Mike Menser original way is really interesting to do. And if you're timing the reps on top of that, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Plus it's, it, the, the numbers can't be more true. It's a one rep max, basically repeated a few times. If you go up and wait, it's right on your chart. This is a strength increase, pure and simple. Right. Yeah. Where, so just, just remind me of that protocol. So you find your one rep max on a given exercise, you do one rep, you lower it down. Um, and then what, what's the break in between before the next set? It's a, it's, it, it's enough of a break. Menser says it's enough of a break where you can get the next rep. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you're not trying to take a three minute rest. You know, it's, you, you're not letting go of the bar. It's breaths. You're taking breaths. So you're ready to go and you, Hit it again. If yeah. you can't get at least three, then the weight's too heavy. It's it's like a one rep max that that's just at your absolute limit. So you're looking for a weight that then that'll enable you to repeat this three. And let's say the fourth one you can't get, great. You got three three rest pause reps. Mm -hmm. Next time you're going for four, when you can get to six of those singles, basically six singles, right? When you can get to six of those, you need more weight. Right. Yeah. Interesting. It's I just found this. I've just found for myself talking selfishly for a moment. I believe that I'm just one of these people where I just fatigue really fast. You know, you remember, I think Arthur Jones has this story or well, there's this case study or whatever, um, where he had a subject and the subject fatigued really early 
and he was like berating him or something like that. Like he didn't, I don't know, didn't wasn't doing the, the protocol properly or whatever. And then he later realized that the individual just had a, just fatigued very fast. He was incredibly strong and capable, right. but just fatigued fast. It wasn't him fatiguing soon. Wasn't necessarily a, a sign that he was, you know, poorly uh, conditioned or anything like that uh, or weak. Um, anyway, so not to compare myself to that individual, but I find for myself that I, I tend to fatigue fairly. I can keep stacking the weight up, but I'll fatigue at the kind of the same point. Um, so, in, well, actually, let me be clear about that. So I can, it's weird. So like take a yeah, Medex chest press, for example, I can put it at like, I'll be like 310 pounds, let's say, and I can incrementally increase that by like two pounds every week. And I will like always fail at the same time under load. I think that's probably something that a lot of people can relate to. Um, and I find for me, rest pauses are normally not that productive <laughs> by my standards for me personally, just because if I go to failure on a set, so I'm not talking about specifically the protocol you just talked about, I'm talking about rest pause in a more, I guess, traditional sense where you're doing a single set to failure, let's say eight to 12 reps, two, four, and yeah. then you're doing a rest pause, so you're whatever, giving it 20 seconds and then going for another set to failure. I just find I'm so smoked. I, I will lucky to get one rep even if I have a 20 second break. And so I'm better off doing like drop sets. And even then I suck <laughs> drop sets. Like I might get two or three. And I don't know whether that's my wiring, my genetics, or whether it's um, maybe I'm, that's just actually what's expected of those protocols sometimes. I don't know. So it's just, well, just some food for thought. That's what's expected. If you look at Dr. Westcott's research, if you do a breakdown, which a breakdown is actually one of my favorites. I mean, I love, I love the rest, I love lifting heavy. I, you know, I want the heaviest weight possible. It's just it's stimulating, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I use breakdowns quite often because it's safe and effective and I can, you know, it, it, it's time efficient. Um, if Dr. Westcott's breakdowns are the trainer moves the pin quickly, they already know where they're going with that and gets the client back in and they're only getting two or three more reps. If they're getting eight or 12 more reps, yeah. it, was, yeah. it wasn't what the, the, the intention was. So you're doing it properly especially if you're moving the pin quickly and getting rid of it. So you're, you're like a perfect subject for Dr. Westcott. Great. Oh, I appreciate that. So uh, where, where are we heading next? Uh, rep ranges. Rep ranges are fascinating. Rep ranges are, I mean, the rate research over the years. So um, Jones was an eight to 12 reps to failure guy. And that's what, you know, we really centered around that. Like you don't want to do fewer than eight. You don't want to do more than 12. And if you do, you need to adjust your weights and go. And you know what? I've seen research done by notable researchers that have shown that, you know what, that, that general guideline is pretty effective for hypertrophy and strength and, and a good combination of both. And it's held up for 50 years. Okay. Of course, there are exceptions. Menser was a three to six or a four to six rep guy. A lot of his work was, uh, has to be a lot heavier and the reps have to be a lot lower. His work show really held up over the years. Not that Jones was wrong, it's just that both were correct. So, uh, he said research. If you go on YouTube and pull up rep ranges for notable researchers only and meta-analysis, you'll find that the current numbers are five to 30. So reps as few as five and as high as 30 to failure are producing similar results. Yep. I've heard that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is recent research that they're just coming around to. If you look at Menser's research, now you can't call Menser's, you can't call it research, right? But his observations, okay, in his training. And I made a note of this, and I really want to, I really want to really just put it out there for for those of you who have never heard of it. Uh, it's fascinating. And for those of you that know it, you're gonna be, you're gonna put, it's gonna put a smile on your face because it's just great stuff. Mike Menser, when he started his uh, personal training business, and I think this is in the uh, early 90s, uh, when, when he really tried to make a, a hit resurgence and, and get his, you know, make some money. Um, he had the opportunity to train uh, a gentleman named David Paul. David Paul had a twin brother named Peter. And the Paul brothers were also known as the Barbarian brothers. They had this brutal training style uh, in the 80s. They were twins that looked identical in physique and face. 
Um, and their, their goal was to win the Mr. America contest in a tie. The twins would win it together. They, at the time, were promoting in the magazines their training style, which was, well, first of all, the way they dressed. They wore um, flannel shirts and jeans to their workouts, which was quite the opposite of what everybody else was wearing in the 80s. They had the, the clown pants and the stupid spandex outfits, right? But um, in addition to that, the workouts, it, I, I, they definitely weren't less than two hours ever and mo more likely three to four hours, six days a week. Wow. And with incredible weights and ridiculous volumes. And their big thing was, there's no such thing as overtraining. There's only under eating. <laughs> and now you got 14 year olds that are like, mom, dad, I need more food. That was the problem, right? <laughs> you know, and spending two hours a day killing themselves and not recovering. No, these guys look good, I see. I've, I've heard of them. I think they, they, you know, if you look them up, they, they were, they were Mr. America bodies. Oh, I see. Okay. They were competitive at that level. Now, um, you're going to say, well, they were taking steroids like, like, well, yeah, like Mencer and everybody else. And they also had good, some good parents. Uh, they chose yeah, their parents right, wisely you know, as, as, as Mensa would say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, so Mike Mencer took one of these brothers who, who was working out two hours, two to three hours a day, six days a week and said, do me a favor. I'd like to supervise your leg workout only. And I would like, and, and this was during a break period that this gentleman was taking. So he wasn't training his other way uh, in the off hours. All right, let me just read it to you. The strongest client I ever had was able to perform 33 reps with the Nautilus leg extension. I believe, a, a mentor doesn't say it here, but I believe the Nautilus leg extension had a 250 pound stack on it, at least at this time. Nice. Okay. And so... He was able to perform 33 reps on the Nautilus leg extension with the whole stack. And that was the incredibly well-developed, strong genetic freak, the famed David Paul of the Barbarian Brothers. When David first started having me supervise his workouts, he performed 15 reps on the leg extension and then went immediately in superset fashion to the Nautilus leg press, where he performed 18 reps to complete failure with the full stack. And at the time, the Nautilus leg press, side note, was a 510 pound stack. So 250 and 510 is what David's working with, workout number one, 15 and 18 reps, respectively. One week later, seven days later, David performed 25 reps on the leg extension and immediately ran to the leg press where he did 38 reps. Impressive, right? Well, that's uh, not just just for me. Okay. One week after that, he did 33 reps on the leg extension, followed by 71 reps to failure on the leg press with 510 pounds. In both exercises, he again employed the entire weight stacks. Uh, and, and the above is not in misprint. He, re he performed 71 reps consecutively. There were no breaks in between. Uh, Menser calculates that's a 388% 380, increase in functional ability of the quadriceps uh, in an already highly advanced bodybuilder or a trained athlete. But isn't that like a lot of that motor learning, just getting really good at the scale of, of both those movements? Possibly. But, mm -hmm. but if you look at research done by anybody these days, they, they look at trained versus untrained. You know, the, the beginner is going to make a great increase. They're going to gain, they can gain 24 pounds of muscle in their first year because they're untrained and still developing. But the trained athlete, guys, guys like you and I that have many years under our belt, for us to gain one pound in a year is is is, is a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. This is a trained this is a trained athlete. Um, either way, whatever his state was, maybe he decompensated for six months and didn't work out at all, and he was rebuilding. It's still a pretty impressive number, right? Oh yes, I mean it makes me sick just thinking about it, you know. Did, I, did he have to be carried afterwards, you know, 70 odd reps on the leg press to failure? <laughs> he, yeah, he talks about, you know, well, Casey Vieter, uh, and during his workouts, Jones would have uh, two guys there spotting him. Not that they needed to spot him as much as they need. They actually literally grabbed him by the arms and pulled him to the next machine. <laughs> Casey was trying to catch his breath or drink water. And Jones said, no, boom, no rest. You know, so oh, my God.
Today's episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your one-stop solution for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. When it comes to high-intensity training, it's about the right workout machines intelligently designed for your studio. That's the specialty of Imagine Strength. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, they've pioneered efficient and affordable fitness equipment perfectly crafted for your HIT business. With a team that lives and breathes HIT, Imagine Strength combines passion, innovation, and careful design into every piece of equipment, creating the perfect environment for an intense yet rewarding workout. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they create innovative, tailor-made equipment for HIT studios. Number two, they provide cost-efficient designs, making HIT more accessible. And number three, they're committed to continuous innovation and refinement so your studio never falls behind. Elevate your HIT business with a team at Imagine Strength. Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and select the gear that'll take your business to new heights. Be a part of the HIT revolution with Imagine Strength and see how their equipment can transform your workout experience. Benzer does point out that these increases are, are considerable when you, when you take into consideration that uh, for the previous five years, David was a volume trainer involving sessions that lasted at least two hours, sometimes twice a day, six days a week, and yielded zero strength and size increases. My point to all this is that even back in these early 90s, now Menser was a, a, the only way you're going to make increases is in the four to six rep range, right? And when I read this, I'm like, well, well, hold on. And we're not in the four to six rep range. You're at 71 and still making increases. You know, what's up with this? And I actually had a friend back then who would go once a year. I'm like, you know, how we all take vacations and like to go to the beach. This guy would save up his money and go train with Mike Menser in California from New York. He would he would fly out there, make an appointment with Menser, get a workout with him, go over his training notes, like talk about a field trip, right? How awesome is that? <laughs> and he would talk to him and say, hey, listen, when you, when you see Mike this week, ask him about this, ask him about, you know, I had questions and he would relay them. But the rep ranges were pretty large. I mean, Menser was four to six reps. So let's take the low number four. And here he is giving David Paul 71 reps to failure and getting a result. So the range was four to 71 in the nineties. So, you know, don't overthink rep ranges mm -hmm. is, is the, the real point here. You can get a result. Failure is the, is the goal, right? Or challenge, challenge the muscle. Don't worry about the rest of it. It all works. Great point. Important takeaway. Mm -hmm. Let's scroll back up and look at, um, uh, how you can customize these techniques, okay? And, the, and, and uh, let's go, so we'll, let's take the standard Nautilus protocol, 2-4 protocol, and let's just rattle off. We have extending the set with breakdowns, forced reps or assisted reps, uh, slower reps, um, uh, pre-exhaust, negative only, negative accentu accentuated, and rest pause. You can literally take all of that that I just mentioned and put them in any combination you want. And it's all good. It all works. Now, of course, you want to take into consideration safe and effective, right? Say, well, safety anyway, not, not necessarily effective. It's all effective. Okay. But safety is it appropriate for your client? Is it appropriate for you? But all of it. And when you think about what I, I just rattled off about eight or nine things, you could put them in any combination. It's got to be a couple of hundred combinations when you get down to it, right? Especially when you add in like a third or a fourth, like uh, you could take eight to 10, eight to 12 reps to failure plus five forced reps. Okay, great. That's one. Uh, eight to 12 reps to failure plus a static contraction and a slow negative. Well, how many variations can you come up with that? Another, another dozen variations, just them down alone, right? Uh, the, the forced reps, there's quite a few variations on how many forced reps you're going to add. Um, just a question on, sta on statics. What's your, um, where do you generally advise people, uh, clients do, or, or trainers deliver statics? Do you, is there any particular point in the range of motion where you think that they're best employed in your experience? A hundred percent. I'm so glad you asked that. Uh, okay. and, and, um, I, uh, with, with short range reps and statics, it's always at the, the initial, uh, lift off of the weight. So in the leg press, it's the first inch, not the last inch. 
when you're, even if you're not locked out completely in the chest press, it's two inches forward. Um, you know, just off your chest, uh, obviously the uh, side lateral is going to be in the contracted position, but that's a, that's a rare movement. In the biceps, it's going to be, depending on the machine or the barbell or the dumbbell, it's going to be right in the middle at the 90 degree position. You want to where you're at the, you have the least advantage over the weight. You want to yep. have the best attraction possible for statics. I love uh, statics. As all of you know, a static contraction is 20% stronger than a positive rep. And a, and a negative a rep, a negative rep is 40% stronger than a positive rep. Uh, or twenty percent stronger than the static. So, you got a hundred, a uh, hundred pounds, one hundred twenty pounds, and one hundred and forty pounds. If you were laying out uh, a strength model that way, I use static reps quite often in my training. A uh, client comes in and they just don't have the focus to go through my basic protocol. Here, I'm going to give you twenty pounds more than you're able to lift. I'm going to help you in a position which is only two inches forward. We're going to do it together. They love that, by the way that you're involved in the set. And how much effort does it take on my part to do that 20 times a day? Five pounds of pressure. It's not gonna wear me out, okay? Okay, we're in position, don't move. 30 seconds, that's your goal. You wanna get 30 seconds and we're gonna then do either another one or go to another exercise. It's really making them work harder than they normally would have that day or in general. Sure. It's productive, it's safe. Uh, if you believe a wall sit, is a safe, effective exercise, then a static contraction on a leg press is even more, is just as safe and probably more productive because you got numbers now. Do you know, I was doing that yesterday, right? So I was doing a squat position on a Medex leg press and I, I was just not, I was sort of coming off a little bit of an illness. So I wasn't hundred percent. So I kind of was probably two or three reps shy of failure. Um, and uh, I thought, oh, okay, you know, I can't just leave it there. I have to do a little bit more volume. So I did a couple more reps, then I let, then I, I, I held it at that static position right out the gate, which we all know in a leg press is probably the most uncomfortable um, position on any exercise, any movement poss possibly possible. Um, and I got really distracted because a client walked in, it was one of the other trainers was training them and they were like, Hey, Lawrence. And I was just like, oh, I can't hold this anymore. <laughs> like the, the distraction was too much. And. You know, a lot of the purists sort of listening to us go, that's why the ideal exercise environment is so important. And I don't agree with that necessarily. I just found it funny. And, um, and how much did you pay that client to come in and, and save you? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah. No, I want you to come point. in after 15 seconds and say, hi, Lawrence. Yeah, like, right. this damn thing down. <laughs> yeah, fair point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, so I was grateful for her, uh, her relieving me of that discomfort. Um, but a question I had for you is, is I, this is how I used to kind of do this. So I don't train as many clients these days. Um, but what I used to do is I'd be very aware of this, the importance of variety and using advanced techniques, which is, I guess, how I would kind of label all of these things. Um, and what I would do is I would try not to overwhelm myself with trying to be overly creative. So I would say, okay, for this day or for this block, I'm going to just use accentuated negative or I'm just going to use drop sets or I'm just going to do a static hold. And I do the same protocol across every exercise for every client. Maybe that's a little bit boring. Maybe it, yeah, it would be enhanced if I had a little bit more creativity. Maybe I had one client I did. Well, I guess it doesn't matter if you're doing across all clients, but maybe I could have created more variety in one workout for one client. So some drop sets, some wrist balls, some force reps, et cetera. Um, and obviously over time, you just get this almost, you turn on autopilot, don't you? And you're able to do these things on the fly without really thinking about it, which is one solve to all of this. But I guess the question I was sort of getting to is how do you decide, or how did you decide how, what you were going to use in terms of protocols? How did you, did you plan ahead? Did you decide, okay, this is exactly how it's going to go? How much of it was on the fly? I'm just curious how you take all of this knowledge and put it into practice. First of all, you're exactly correct. I, I, I did the exact same thing. Uh, Monday morning, they all got it until Saturday afternoon. Um, now there's exceptions, the client that comes in with back pain or a medical issue or something like that, obviously you're doing what you do for them, but everybody else who was capable, it was, uh, it's a sales tool for me. 
Uh, 100%. It's, you know, hey, we're going to do two forced reps on every set today. You know, whatever I came up with. And how did I come up with it? You know, I mean, how disgusting is this when you look at my life? If I'm, I'm doing 20 to 24 sessions in a day, uh, five to six days a week, usually six. Um, and in my spare time, I'm on the internet or I'm reading high intensity books or, you know, <laughs> Arthur Jones or going through the Nautilus bulletins in my spare time. Like, how sick is that? It's just, you know, I was into it, right? No, it's not at all. It's standard for all of our listeners, I suspect. Right? And, and you're, you're just like, you know what? I'm going to do this this week. You know, mm -hmm. and just something just jumps out at you. Um, also, it's just to break up my monotony. If you're doing 120 sessions in a week, you know, you, you want to just gear yourself up for these. And when I come in with a new idea that, you know, like, hey, Lawrence, you and I are talking about rest pause reps. You know what they are. It's not exciting and new to you, but it, it, it may be a stimulating conversation, right? You know, let's try that. But these people never heard of it before. And every single session, you're explaining something that they never heard of, which makes it exciting for me. I'm sharing information that's new to them. That is selling my next month's package, whether they know it or not, whether I know it or not. I mean, and, and that's what it comes down to. And my point is with all these variations, there is an infinite number of variations that we can talk about and get into. We can't list them all, but guess what? Every single one of them is a sales tool. I, you got me thinking here, like you, you've got a whole uh, a list of protocols here and we'll get to these in a moment. Um, you've also got other protocols you've mentioned on my last po uh, first podcast we did together and a YouTube video, which I'll definitely link to. Uh, and we might even get into some of those today as well, but, um, you could, I don't know why I haven't thought about this and, and, but you could literally calendar this out. January is drop set month. Right. <laughs> February is negative only month. March is statics. Like, and uh, you're absolutely right. You know, it's uh, there's a naming a service and making it different each month almost sounds like an, a promotion. It's very powerful in in sales conversions and in probably retaining cl clients and keeping things exciting and novel. So this is, I don't know why I haven't thought about it in this way. Like I actually could calendar it out like that. Cause it got the reason, the thing that got me thinking about that is, um, embody my science. And if you remember, Doug talks about the idea of, um, for your own training in terms of baking in enough recovery is to have, you know, it planned out on a, on an annual basis where you might have one month where you do kind of higher volume with more, um, intensity and more advanced techniques, and then you taper off the next month. And then maybe you do it again another month and you kind of calendar out like that. So you kind of bake in that recovery over time to support the producer, producer results. Um, so it's not, it's not quite, I guess it is a, it is in a way, a, 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 a similar to periodization, but in kind of a hit context. Um, right. but anyway, now I'm talking about this more from a business marketing perspective. And, um, I think that's a really good way to do it. But anyway, 100%, why not? Yeah. I mean, it, 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 you could literally have with what we just discussed, you could have 52 different protocols and have one a week, you know, yes. or, yes. or yeah, or January is forced rep month. I mean, yes, that, <laughs> I love that, that is more, that's what takes our business to the next level. That's what makes you more money. It also, and this is probably the even more important, it keeps you engaged and it keeps you enthusiastic. Because the minute you get bored or you, you, you know, you get into, and I, I would find this to myself, you know, I'm knocking out a lot of sessions and if I'm starting to space out a little bit, I would make a mental note. We need something for this week that stimulates me. Yeah. And, so and that's really yeah. important. You're out, right? so obviously thinking about trainer retention, keeping trainers engaged in the, in the, in the workout and, and as, as employees is super important. So it's important for that. And. Uh, you just got my gears turning now. I'm thinking of all the alliteration you might be able to use in your protocol. Uh, I know you said force reps January, but I'm thinking, how could you, um, I don't have to think about this, but how could you have it not rhyme? I sort of use alliteration for each month to, uh, to make it just, you know, roll off the tongue for that, that, oh, that month's protocol. I would totally be all about that. Yeah. So like, you know, January J reps, right? You remember J reps from, um, I do remember Brian Johnson, Johnson. Yeah. Brian uh, Johnson, Jan yeah. Jan January. January, January, February, force reps. There um, you go. 
March Madness, because that's in line with everything. March going Madness. <laughs> that's a, that's that's, a given. That, that. <laughs> and you could do something with holidays, right? There's got to be the 4th of July fireworks, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. Not, yeah. not for you, not for you in Ireland, but for our, the Americans, we can do that. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Um, I, do, I would say Discover Strength do this very well. I'm sure there are plenty of our colleagues that do this well that I'm not even aware of. There's people probably listening to this going, Lord, yes, Lawrence, we've been doing this for years. Um, but I know that Discover Strength do seasonal stuff. So like in Halloween, they'll do special scary workouts and they'll call them like Halloween based names. Like, um, and I think they had one workout, which is like Count Dracula, which was like a really long time under load um, style workout where there was just yeah, a lot of time under load and that kind of thing. And I thought that, and then, and then all the, you know, all the trainers will dress up for Halloween. And I just think that's great. That type of thing. It takes a fair bit right. of effort, but. It's, it makes it fun. Yeah. It's brilliant. It, it engages the, yeah. the, the trainers, the trainees. It's good for everybody. Everybody needs that mental break. Absolutely. You know, stimulation. So it's very, very important. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. We can add rep speed to this. Again, in infinite rounds. Uh, two, four is the basic standard protocol. Then there is four, four, four second positive, four second negative. There is eight, eight, 10, 10. Uh, Ellington Darden wrote about a uh, 30, 30, 30 protocol, and it goes specifically in this order, negative, positive, negative for 30 seconds apiece. Uh, obviously only a couple of exercises you can do that with, but like, uh, the, I think it was first developed with the, uh, the chin, uh, underhand grip, chin up, uh, 30 second lowering, quick pause at the bottom, 30 second positive, which is absolutely brutal mm-hmm. and followed by your last 30 second negative, great protocol. Um, uh, and how many variations can you, can you do 25, 25, 25? Sure you can. Why not? Negative only, uh, can have a, a wide variety of times. Question. Attached. Sorry. Sure. If I'm training two, four, and I want to try out 30, 30, 30, which I haven't tried out recently, uh, as much as I'd like to, how much would you reduce the weight by? Cause I feel like I've made the mistake before of going from two four to a slow movement speed and really struggling with my two four weight because there is obviously a small bit of momentum when you're doing two four like control momentum I think. Um, so what would you what would you reduce weight by like twenty percent ten percent? I actually had a, a the the Nautilus Multi um, Omni what was it called the Omni Multi Omni oh, exercise right. which was the chin dip adjustable. Okay, uh, I, had, I had one refurbished in my studio with my medics equipment. Um, and I took women and, and I had a minimum, you had to be at least 60 years old and training with me for a period of time on the pull down and stuff like that. And I would take them over and do negative only chins underhand grip for time. Uh, and that's the only time I ever switched somebody from, you know, positive reps or negative reps or assisted reps to a negative only exercise and nobody ever got injured. And the strength gains were fantastic. So, and I would use that information for young, for men and for younger people to really just, you know, verbally abuse them. Like I got a 65 year old that just did a 30 second negative. <laughs> you know, give me something here. Let's get some effort in here. But, uh, so I don't know. I don't know if I would change your weight or I would encourage you to get over to a chin or a dip if you have access to one. Yeah, no, I do. We don't, we don't have one of the studio currently. We, we were trying to get a medex multi exercise. They're just very expensive and then hard to get on the secondary market. Um, and, uh, I don't know if, uh, our friends at Imagine Strength have a, a multi exercise type of, uh, machine yet. They might do Jeff can correct me. Uh, but if they do it's something we certainly be looking at, um, with their machines, they're awesome. So. Yeah, I don't know. I uh, no, but I lo- I love doing bodyweight stuff. Like I love doing, um, yeah, chin ups, uh, dips, all that kind of stuff. We just don't have something in place right now. But I have I have it at home, so I tend to like old say I'll do one workout at the studio every week, um, and then one workout at home every week. It just works for my lifestyle quite well. Anyway, digressing there. Great. Okay. Yeah. And and the the main takeaway of this is that it all works. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, they haven't nobody's going to come to me and say, well, you know, eight second positives are much more nonsense. Yeah, you, you, you don't know what you're talking about. It's all good. What's this? Uh, sorry, I know you were going to probably go into this, but Joe Cerulli's Six Ways to 60. I've not heard that one before. 
In one of Ellington Doran's books, he interviews Joe Cirulli. Joe, Joe Cir Cirulli is in uh, Florida, and he owns, uh, oh, forgive me. I don't remember the D name. Gainesville Health and Fitness. Gainesville yeah. Health. He's, been, he's a legend. He's been on the podcast. He's a legend. Yeah. He's, he's great. And he wrote a thing, Six Ways to 60, and it's six different ways he gets to 60-second sets. It could be one rep, two reps, three reps, eight reps. But he has six ways to 60. Again, showing that it's all good. It all works. And he was just shaking it up. So, you know, if this client came into it, today we're going to do your 60 seconds uh, sets, but you're going to do it in one rep. And I'm going to talk you through it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Next time they come in, they got to do it in five reps. Well, the client doesn't want to do the math. So it's really on the trainer to, to get them there. Right. So it's, you know, it's, it's something so Simple, yet so brilliant. Six ways to 60. And Joe's not reinventing the wheel. He's just kind of owning it and working with it and using it as a tool for himself, which is, you know, that, that's what, if you want to make money at this, that's what you got to do. You're not trying to be right and be published. Wow, Lawrence actually came up with a three and a half second positive, which turned out to be 0.10% better than anything else who cares like i don't care it's not gonna do but if it's something that you're enthusiastic about when your client walks in or for your own workouts that's the way that's where you're going with this. so ultimately but yeah joe cerulli six ways to 60 that's in ellington darden's most recent book i believe it's a long thin book uh the new high intensity bodybuilding or something like that i think casey theater's on the cover uh but he interviews a lot of notable people. Uh, Casey's in there. Um, people who knew or worked with Arthur Jones is in there. Jim Flanagan's in there. I think I've read it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great book. If you're, if you're, well, anybody watching this probably has already read it, but if you haven't, it's a very it's, interesting it, 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 It's not new though, is it? Like it's his latest, but it was out quite a few years ago. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Know. Book. yeah. Late, You've written so many, I forget. Years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time's flying here. No. <laughs> Let's talk um, about yeah. training protocols. What's the ultimate? Uh, oh, let me give you my ultimate answer. The ultimate answer is any training protocol that stimulates muscle protein synthesis, followed by a recovery period that allows the process to take place, is effective. That's my quote. <laughs> yeah, it's really just reinforcing what we've been saying, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I'm. You know, I, I, you were saying something that, uh, earlier about, uh, you know, uh, monthly and monthly protocols and sure. making it really fun. Mike Lepowski, a good friend of ours, uh, has done something similar where he's cracked the code and he showed me, um, he has written out, I'm going to say, and I don't, don't call me on this, but I've been 150 different workouts yep. in advance. So his clients, and they're already written out. Uh, his clients will not repeat the same workout for 12, 13, 14 months. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I remember him saying it's, it's so scientific interesting. protocols, right? But he's, yeah. and, um, and that's, and I'm like, how brilliant is that? How brilliant yeah. is that? The client's not going to repeat the same workout twice. And that's, that's his thing, but highly successful. That's what makes him very successful. These tools are here for you guys to be really successful. Which ones do you love? Use them. Which ones do you hate? Stay away from them. Because mm -hmm. if you don't like them, they're not going to like them. That's really important. You know, if you light up about it, they're going to light up about the fact that you lit up. Like it's, it's that infectious. And what does that do? That makes them sign up again and again and again. So I get, I get, um, I get why you have to uh, be passionate, obviously, when you're delivering the protocol. Where I'm slightly in conflict with that, and I'm curious how you think about this, is you, you listen to mine and Luke's podcast where we talked about um, designing the business for the consumer, for your target market, right? And I remember you, you commented on YouTube, which I appreciate, Pete. Um, and it was, perhaps to you, pretty obvious. To me, it was, uh, it was a really good wake-up call. Like, it's stuff that, it's one of those things where you hear it, you're like, I knew that, but I didn't know, I needed to hear it again, or I needed to hear it in a different way. Um, yeah. 
because because you know i speak to luke so much i'm very fortunate to be able to do that and he's shared so much with me and taught me so much that i he has taught me that in a number of different ways i guess um where i'm going with this though sorry to my to my question my point is um i would have so that podcast kind of explains that actually you know we want to we want to tailor our operation, including our workout protocol our approach to training to the consumer, but to our particular target market. And I think we perhaps have to be careful and discern between what protocols we might be passionate about and what, you know, 42 year old busy mom, Jane, who's got three kids, how he, she likes to work out. You know, for example, I remember training, a, I used to train a, a friend's wife virtually, um, and I, I, I love doing squats, for instance, bodyweight squats or goblet squats, you know, and she hated squats. So I took squats out. Oh, no, sorry. That's not right. Split squats. I enjoy doing split squats. I was putting her through split squats. She hated split squats. She's like, I'll do squats all day long. I love doing squats. I'll do squats to muscle failure. I hate split squats. And I was like, you hate split squats, but yeah, they're so good. And they're so important and, you know, being split like that and putting a different emphasis on the other leg might have some other benefits to it, et cetera, maybe help with some imbalances. I don't know. Um, and, but, you know, I listened to her and I thought, well, she's going to get to the kind of, you know, theme of this conversation. She's going to get the same result, basically, or for the most part doing either. So what does it really matter? And if she prefers doing squats, let's do that. So it's a long question. I apologize, Pete. But how do you reconcile what you said with, you know, we actually should be probably molding the protocols around what our target market really wants. And wants is a, a delicate word, isn't it? Because sometimes they don't know what they want and you have to deliver what um, they need or what uh, they don't even know they want is a better way of putting it so they can get the result and the experience they're after. Well, we know what they want. The, the average client wants the benefit without the work. Mm. Think about it. It's the service, right? I mean, you can cut your own hair if you want, but you'd rather go to a barber because let them do it. I don't feel like doing it and I don't feel like sweeping up, right? My basic client, and I've had hundreds of thousands of them over the years, everyone had, had this in common. They, they knew it was good for them. They didn't want to spend a lot of time on it and they wanted a result. And that's what they're paying for. Uh, all of the above. It was one thing exclusively. And did, did I occasionally get an athlete or somebody who was athletic that needed to be pushed to the next level? Yeah, one tenth of one percent of the time, they weren't my money. So we know what the clients want, and I would say that this is just true of any hit business out there. The client, there, there's a lot in common with what, what the client wants. Now, what do you, what are we trying to give them? The service. The service is really important. So these protocols are great and they're fun, and we could talk about them for another three hours. You really want to dial into something that you can do on autopilot, as you said, you know, you can almost space out, deliver it effectively and do it 20 times in a day and a hundred times in a week, should you go that route. And it's fresh every time and it's great. And the clay responds to it. And, oh, that was great service. That was fantastic. Not about the result of the set. And that's what I came up with my, with my protocol called 390. And that's how I did it. I did it hundreds of thousands of times, uh, hundreds of thousands of sets. And, and it never, and listen, if it was going to bore me or lose money for me, I'd throw it out in a heartbeat. It wound up in a book or two or three, you know, it's, it's, it was effective for a reason. The what reason what, what was, protocols were, sorry, Pete, go ahead. No, please. What protocols bored you that you threw out? Do you remember? Super slow. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't last five minutes with it. Um, it didn't make any sense to me. It was, you know, 10, 10 to failure and, and trying to apply that to every single life. And it just, no, that, that math didn't work for me. For others, I'm sure it was very successful. Uh, I needed, I needed because of the high volume of clients I was dealing, I needed definites. And one definite was no set was going to go past 90 seconds. There was no 91 second set um, because I had to know where I was going, the next machine I was going, how long it was going to take. When the client walked in the door 12 minutes late for a 15 minute session, I wanted to know what I can get done. No, don't <laughs> worry. I would tell the next client, 
Hey, I just need a few minutes. No problem. You'll get everything in. I'll take this client in. It's going to be six exercises, nine minutes, boom, boom, boom. You know, I'm three minutes late for this and I'm back on schedule within two clients. You know, I, I needed really, really good numbers. I really, and I need a really good organization. Do you, sprint, you would, you would move swiftly between exercises, I assume when you did it. And no you would, rest. you no rest and you would, you would have the machines preset or you were just quick at setting them up there and then real time. Uh, I always had an order and I work in a general order. I had all my leg machines together here and I had core over here right next to it. And I had upper body in a very specific order that I worked in in general. So if you're on the leg press, uh, and I'm going to, uh, the rotary torso next, it was two steps away. So while I'm talking through the set, I can lean over and set up the next one. Um, my studio design was really important for all the, not for me and all the trainers that we can move efficiently. So, and then now I'm at the, at the rotary torso and I'm talking to Joe and we're going to the pull down next, which is three steps away. And you know what? It's a MedEx machine. So even if there's a trainer on there and I'm waiting for them to get off and I walk over there, it's a pit. It's a pin and an adjustment and a suspension and boom, we're ready. So yeah. it's only a second to set up anyway. Dude, there's something yeah. you got me, something I'll be thinking about, which is a little bit off topic, but it's something I really want to just discuss very briefly. So Alex Hormozzi is very popular at the moment online on the internet. Um, he's, his content is just amazing. I'm sure many of the listeners have heard of him. So many of you who are growing fitness businesses, growing a hit business should definitely um, check out his stuff. I'm very happy to promote him because I'm, I, I look at stuff a lot. Um, and a lot of it's free. So if you go to his website, acquisition.com, he's got loads of free courses on how to grow your business, generate leads. Um, and I've been sort of working through it to update high intensity business update, you know, our services and, uh, and make sure we're delivering as much value as possible. Um, and one of the things he comes up with is this thing called the value equation, which is an equation you go through to, you know, basically create the dream outcome for your particular prospect. Um, and the equation is dream outcome. So maybe that I'm just in a hit context. Let's say the dream outcome is, um, you know, to be whatever it is, 50% stronger or something like that. I think that's a good fit for us for the most part. Uh, multiplied by perceived likelihood of achievement. So of us, we know it's an absolute guaranteed uh, likelihood of achievement if they can be consistent over, say, a six to 12 month period. Like that's what the data shows. I mean, remember the Fit20 study? I think they saw a 50% strength improvement in year one, something like that. I could be slightly out there on that, but it's something like that. Divided by, so dream outcome times perceived likelihood of achievement divided by time delay times effort and sacrifice. Now, time delay, again, we have a real advantage there because we can see results very quickly, especially the way we do it, where we push people to failure. Honestly, you're seeing radical, rapid improvements in strength and all uh, various other outcomes multiplied by effort and sacrifice. Here's the difficult one because sacrifice is, is so, and effort is somewhat resolved through brief, intense workouts, right? It's 30 minutes. It's a couple of times a week, you know, more efficient than anything anyone else could possibly do. And I think something you've reminded me about that's really key on this podcast is the part, the main reason for using advanced techniques, aside from novelty and excitement, is making it easier. That's a key word here, easier for a client to get to muscle failure. And it's making it more tolerant for them, right? For the most part, unless they're like some masochists, they're a five out of five intensity and they want the kitchen sink thrown at them. It's a bit different. Um, so I feel like that's another way that we elicit more effort without them uh, having to use more effort in a kind of crude kind of way. But I do still think there's a slight barrier in our business because unfortunately there isn't a pill you can take yet. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, because <laughs> um, obviously, yeah, obviously, because yeah, resistance training is really good for uh, obviously showing, like, like Doug said, it de makes you better at doing hard things. It feels, yeah. you feel so awesome afterwards and you feel like you can take on the world. And I always feel so pumped and so creative uh, mentally and physically. And, um, and so anyway, but just looking at it purely for a business lens and purely for how can we get more people doing this, um, there is that element about effort. That's, it's not a pill, right? It's, not a, it's like comparing Xanax to meditation, right? Xanax sells way more pills because meditation takes discipline and effort, whereas strength training. So that's something that I think 
obviously, the, 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 uh, maybe we can be more creative, but I'd love to hear how you think about that. How do you make it? I guess the question I'm getting to here is, how do you, um, how, how were you able to convert clients and keep clients and never have them kind of like, never lose clients based on that effort aspect, right? Making it, I mean, one of those is obviously your ability to deliver novel stimulus and helping clients get to failure in a creative way. But I'm just curious how you think about that, how you got over the effort obstacle with clients in the past. It was easy. It was the protocol. The 390 protocol solved all, the, all those problems. Keep in mind that over 100,000 sessions, I never took anybody to failure. Right. Not once. I did in the beginning. And when I was taking another failure, business was, it started to go up. And then it started to go down. Um, I mean, you can't put people on the floor. I was doing it in the beginning to make a point. You know, you don't have to work out six days a week. I'll kill you in 15 minutes. Literally, you'll be on the floor. And that was a marketing technique I needed just to get my name out there and make my point and my reputation. Oh, you got <laughs> If you could survive 15 minutes with Pete, it's a miracle, right? Oh, yeah. And the arguments would start and business would go up. Now... I'm getting the clients and the referrals coming in. I had to switch protocols and I came up with 390. And it was, it, you knew exactly how long you were going to be on this machine for. You knew pretty much how many reps you were going to do. You were going to get excellent instruction and you were going to work to challenge the muscle, mm -hmm. not to failure. And I stopped it. I stopped failure completely and I never went to failure again. Results were the same, not better, not worse. Right. And that's, that's important to know. So it's like, you know, if I, if I would have went to failure, would I, have, would I have gotten this much more? Maybe, but I got this many more clients. So, yeah, I love I, it. It's so interesting because, you know, it's, it's from what I understand in terms of, um, like, firstly, we don't know if failure is magic. Like we don't know. It's just a, it's just a, the way, I guess the reason a lot of us focus on it is we know it's a catch all. We know if you've got there, we know that you've, um, you, you flick the switch is, is the analogy is often used. But the reality is, is there's loads of research out there showing people way short of failure in, a, in studies and they're getting good results. They're getting good outcomes. So I, I, I find this very interesting, this idea of maybe not always going there. Yeah. I had a top heart surgeon was one of my clients, a woman, mm. brilliant woman, uh, who worked with another heart surgeon and they did groundbreaking aneurysm repairs, which are mind blowing. And I'm obviously dealing wow. with an intelligent person. And she did a little research on training, you know, my training protocol and other training protocols and came in and we had a few workouts together. And she said, I'm really, I really like what you're doing with the 390 was what I was giving her. She said, can I ask you why you don't take your clients to failure? I said, do you have to kill your patient to prove you saved their life? And she said, no. I said, right, they were asleep, they were under anesthesia, you repaired the aneurysm and you woke them up and you told them you repaired the aneurysm. You didn't have to go, you know, clear, get the paddles. See, I saved you. You know, here we took <laughs> the up, died for five minutes. I said, that's failure. We don't, you know, we want to challenge the muscle. So we, we really can't think past, well, we have to annihilate you mm. and show you that you challenged your muscle. And I just thought of it differently. I, I think I could do it mathematically and, and get you there without that. Can we, I'm just conscious of your time now, P, because we've spoken for ages. Um, yeah, we've got to wrap up actually, yeah. Do you mind if we wrap up on 390? Could you give it, because you teased the listeners enough on that and then we'll wrap up straight after that. Is that okay? Yeah. So 390 is a protocol I put together. It's, uh, it's ultimately three reps in 90 seconds, but it starts out as a game and a score. So. I get my client into a machine on a, you know, you're always doing a consultation or a first workout or a first exercise is usually going to be the leg press, right? In my case, it was the medics leg press. I get them in position. I write their settings down on the chart and I say, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to walk you through this, but you're going to get 90 seconds to do this set. You're going to try to do as few reps as possible in 90 seconds, which immediately gets their attention and they get that kind of cocky, like, what if I could do it in one or two? I only have to do one or two reps. Yes, you can. That'd be great. What do you mean it'd be great? Don't you want me to do like 40 or 50? No. 
because you're not working efficiently. You're getting too many rest periods. It's too much pump. It's, you know, it's sloppy form. One or two would be phenomenal, but we're going to make our goal three. So you're going to do this. And what if you got eight reps in 90 seconds? Well, eight reps in 90 seconds is far more efficient, safer, and effective than eight reps in eight seconds. And I explain why there. Okay. So now they're getting on the same page with me and they see, I said, you know what? Most important is not the discussion about it, but let me walk you through it. If you would just listen to my cues, this will work out well. So let's say we have 200 pounds on the Menex leg press. Don't judge the number. Um, okay. You're in position, your feet are up, your head's back, you're relaxed. I want you to hold the handles lightly, not too, too firmly. And you have 200 pounds on here. Now I want you to imagine something. If you were to put hundred pounds of pressure in your feet on 200 pounds, it's not going to move, is it? No. Do that for me. Load up and put hundred pounds of pressure on there. Do you feel it? Yes. I started my stopwatch. Now load up to 200 pounds of pressure, which is not going to make that move. It's going to be starting to shake a little bit, right? 200 pounds on 200 pounds. Yes. Okay. Do you feel that? Yes. Now give me 201 pounds of pressure and the weight breaks forward. I'm 30 seconds into the set already just from talking. Into, okay. You feel that now? I want you to maintain that speed. Now here's the tricky part. As you start to straighten your legs out, you're going to be getting a rest period. We want to minimize that. So I want you to speed up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Look at my hands. Here's my hands. Speed up with me. Follow me like this. Okay. Now turn it around. I don't want you to snap and start bringing it back. Now here, here's the tension in the muscle. Slow down. Go as slow as you can. You want to stop for a second? You can even stop for a second. We're at 45, 50, 60 seconds. I didn't even get through the first rep yet. Now we're going to either make 90 seconds on the first rep or they speed. They were speeding up for some reason or didn't get it. Okay, we're going to have to do another rep. So what I want you to do is tap the bottom very lightly, but don't unload. Keep tension on the muscle. We only need one more rep to make this done, uh, make this set. And I talk them through it. I do that 20 plus times a day, six days a week, 5,000 times a year for years. Okay. And it never gets boring. The verbal cues are phenomenal. You always have to talk them through it. Any exercise this applies to, any exercise, okay? And yeah, I make notes on their chart, though this client usually gets somewhere between six to eight reps in 90 seconds. They just can't, can't get that. But that's still better than eight reps in eight seconds. This client likes to nail it in one every time and wants the coaching for it. They're obsessed about the one rep. This client gets it in the three. So we could do 15 second positive, 15 second negative. And those are my notes on the chart. And that's what I like to give them. And of course there's weights and settings and stuff like that and two pound increments, but you know, you can actually find a weight at some point that will last them for quite a long time. It, there's not, you don't always have to go up two pounds of strength. That's nonsense. 400 pounds is always 400 pounds, you know? So that's the service I was selling. And they loved it. They had my full attention. They had verbal cues. I never, there, there was no silence and standing there saying, yeah, that's good. Okay, a little, little slower. Follow me on this. Let's go through it all. And it stimulated me. It stimulated them. It was an excellent product. That's what we're selling, right? A product. It was an excellent product. Is it as good as eight to 12 reps to fail you with five forced reps? Maybe not, <laughs> but it produced a result for them. And I got paid lots of times. <laughs> That's ultimately what it comes down to. Not are you 5% more right than me, but how many more zeros I have than you in my checking account. And that's why I came up with it. Very good. And, um, just for everyone listening, uh, that you also call that chrono dynamics is, um, related term to, to that protocol. Chronodynamics was yeah. the name I came up with to call it for, for the, uh, the entire protocol, which I translates see. to time strength measurement. Got it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's great. Thank you for that. And then also the listeners can, I'll, I'll link to a YouTube video where you can learn about step 90 and ladder 90 as well, which are similar protocols. And, and, uh, again, give you another more strings to your bow to deliver more variety in the workouts. Um, 
Pete, as always, this has been fascinating. I actually think this is our best one yet. And it's a nice long one. Hopefully uh, listeners will will enjoy that or have enjoyed that, I should say, at this point. Um, thank you so much for doing this. And the listeners can learn more about you and find out about your services over at Facebook, can't they? Pete Serqua, P-E-T-E-C-E-R-Q-U-A. We'll link to that from show notes as well. Um, and just for everyone listening, before you do head off, uh, grab your free PDF guide on how to turn your business into a referral machine. It's a short, simple, step-by-step -step guide on how to get more referrals today. Um, there's also a full-length video training with Discover Strengths, Luke Carlson. So you're probably sick of us talking about Luke and Discover Strength, but they are one of, if not the most profitable boutique studio concept by studio in the world. So they really know what they're talking about. Um, so if you want to learn how to really generate referrals, unlock that in your business now, uh, go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref. That's R-E-F, which is short for referrals. And there'll also be a link to that if you can't remember the URL and wherever you're watching this. So if you're watching this on YouTube or any uh, social media platform, you'll see the link there as well. Um, so go there, download it now, highintensitybusiness.com forward slash ref. And um, really appreciate that. Uh, and lastly, to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search episode 427. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Let's go, let's go, let's go. This episode is brought to you by Imagine Strength, your go-to for safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Growing a successful high-intensity training business requires workout equipment that's not only high quality, but also intelligently designed to fit the unique needs of your studio. And that's where Imagine Strength comes in. Drawing on the wisdom of the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength has crafted a groundbreaking line of fitness equipment that's as affordable as it is efficient, giving your studio the upgrade it needs without breaking the bank. The team at Imagine Strength breathes hit. Their passion for high intensity training shines through in their designs, which they've consistently refined and innovated for optimum effectiveness and user experience. From my personal experience at REC, I can attest to the careful consideration and craftsmanship that goes into every single piece. My Imagine Strength workout was absolutely brutal, in a good way, of course. Now, what makes Imagine Strength truly stand out? They have innovative equipment tailored for the unique needs of hit studios, affordable and efficient designs, lowering the barriers to entry for a hit business, continuous innovation and refinement, ensuring your studio stays ahead of the curve. Founder Jeff Turner and his team are dedicated to moving the hit industry forward and making strength training accessible to more people than ever before. Here's how you get started. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, discuss your specific needs with the team. And number three, select the equipment that will propel your business to the next level. Head to imaginestrength.com today and give your hit business the Imagine Strength Edge. Be part of the hit revolution and see firsthand how their unique equipment can transform your studio's workout experience. Elevate your hit business with Imagine Strength. Before we sign off, a reminder about our sponsor, Joint Friendly Fitness by Bill A. Simone. Bill's commitment to crafting this invaluable guide has not gone unnoticed. At Optima Strength, it's become an important reference guide for workout design. And on a personal level, it's reshaped my workouts, focusing on both safety and results. For those navigating the challenges of training related discomfort, injuries, or concerns about joint well being, this book is a beacon. Bill's fusion of first hand insights and biomechanics knowledge has given rise to the joint friendly fitness methodology. John Little, a respected figure in the fitness realm, emphasizes that Bill's books are a mandatory part of their exercise education, highlighting joint friendly fitness as Bill's crowning achievement in the world of exercise science. Similarly, Simon Shawcross, co-founder and director of HitUni.com, labels it a must-read, especially for those keen on strengthening muscles whilst minimizing injury risks. In a world filled with convoluted fitness literature, joint-friendly fitness stands out. It's not just enlightening, but also practical, categorizing exercises by their safety quotient. With a five-star joint-friendly ratings system, you're equipped with a comprehensive exercise arsenal. Boost your fitness journey and fitness business with Joint Friendly Fitness, available on Amazon Worldwide, and elevate your workouts. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Let's go.